Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, firstly, many thanks for taking the time out today to join us for our webinar session. Um, my name is Karen. I'm the Partnership Officer for the Surrey Safeguarding Adults Board. Um, as part of my role, we are developing ways in which we engage and communicate with agencies across the county. Um, and delivering our webinar series is just one of the many ways in which we would like to engage with you all um, and disseminate information and raise awareness around safeguarding issues and priorities. Uh, today we are joined by Lee Ormandy from the county's trading standards team. Uh, Lee has offered his time today to talk about some of the issues around uh, trading standards and how they relate to safeguarding. Um, we are recording today's session, so if you do miss anything Lee mentions, uh, you'll be able to find the full recording on our website. Uh, we'll also the, offer the opportunity for you to ask questions and give feedback using the link, which we will shortly send in the webinar chat bar. Uh, so without further ado, I will now hand over to Lee. OK, thank you very much. Well, it's it's very nice. Welcome everybody to come and um, hear about how trading standards can contribute. Um, I will just share my screen as ever. Just bear in mind that when I am sharing my screen, I can't see anybody or any hands or anything like that. Um, but hopefully that shouldn't be a problem. So start sharing my screen. I just hide that. Yep, can you see that? Yeah, that's come up yeah. perfectly. Fantastic. Right. Excellent. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Lee Ormady, uh, and I'm the Prevention Manager with the Trading Standards Service. Um, and what I'm going to do today is just basically highlight the little piece of the safeguarding jigsaw that trading standards contributes to. Now, hopefully you'll find this of interest. Some of you might find it surprising. Some of you who have already worked with will, will already be aware of it. But this is going to focus a little bit more on the flip side of safeguarding. So that prevention work um, rather than the dealing with the issue afterwards. So first of all, I thought I would start with just explaining trading standards. You know, everybody thinks of trading standards, you know, it's watchdog, it's you bought a washing machine and it broke down and you need your money back. Yes, we do that. That's true. They're very, very important parts of our role. Um, but the actual four key areas are to protect individuals, communities and businesses from harm and financial loss to help businesses thrive by maintaining a fair trading environment, improve the health and well-being of people and communities, and to fulfil our statutory responsibilities to deliver consumer protection. In essence, you can summarise that in trading standards is responsible for ensuring a level playing field. So that's a level playing field between consumers and businesses, so businesses don't take advantage of consumers. And it's also a level playing field between businesses. So no one particular business has an unfair advantage over another. So, for example, if you have one guy selling um, trainers and then the next guy is selling counterfeit trainers at half the price, but they're illegal, it's our job to um, deal with that illegality so the legitimate trader can can trade correctly and profitably. So level playing field. Now trading standards, um, we do, we are a national organisation but we're based within each um, local authority. So each local authority has its own trading standards department. Um, here in Surrey, we also deliver trading standards services in Buckinghamshire as well. So we cover two counties um, and we have quite a diverse range of functions. So that 
on the screen now is just a selection of various functions that we do. So the first one, civil and business advice, that's what I alluded to right at the beginning. So that's where, what are your rights when buying things? What are your rights when buying online? Um, similarly, if um, a new business is opening, what labelling do they need to comply with? Um, what packaging do they need to require with? So the civil and business advice is, is a really, really important one. And that's just to make sure that nobody is getting ripped off, basically. The next one, product safety, um, that is, uh, we are the responsible agency for ensuring that all products comply with um, safety standards. So, for example, you know, uh, iron, an iron isn't going to melt and set fire to your house or um, the hoverboards of a couple of years ago that were really, really popular with kids at Christmas that they're not going to combust and catch fire. So we're very proactive in that type of area. Um, in relation to product safety and indeed other areas, um, part of our proactive work is that we have uh, a team that work at Heathrow. So they're checking goods that are being brought into the United Kingdom um, and stopping them, stopping the dodgy and the dangerous items actually getting it into the marketplace in the first place, which is prevention is always better than cure, definitely. Um, food safety. So that is we have a food team who are responsible for ensuring that food labelling is accurate, that is misleading. Um, that it has, for example, the correct allergens on it, um, because allergens can be, you know, a potentially lethal issue. So we have food officers that not only help food businesses to be correct in the first place, but they also monitor and visit shops and things to make sure that the packaging and the food is accurate. So, for example, a bit, bit of a silly example, but if if something, if you get a sandwich and it says it's buttered, has to have butter on it, not margarine. It's some things like that. Metrology or weights and measures. This is a really, really important one, especially in the current economic climate. So uh, we have specialist metrology officers who are responsible for ensuring that all devices are calibrated correctly and are providing accurate measures. So that could be anything from a petrol pump so to make sure that you're getting your full 40 litres into your car to um, spirits. Are you getting the full 25 millilitres of vodka or a full pint or anything in between? Sweet, sweet shops, um, green grocers, butchers, anything that's got a device which weighs or measures something we are the responsible authority for ensuring that those are accurate. Fair trading and fraud, that's what I'm going to touch upon today. Age restricted sales, so that's in relation to products where you have to be a certain age to buy them. So the obvious one is tobacco and alcohol, but we're very um, active at the moment in relation to vapes, and we're really trying to crack down on vapes and also um, nitrous oxide, both of which there are some uh, changes due in the law which will make it a lot easier. But what people may not be aware of, there are many, many other age restricted products. Um, for example, um, Christmas crackers, you have to be 12 to buy Christmas crackers. Um, you have to be 16 to buy a pet. There are lots of little sort of niche ones as well that um, if we have time at the end, we may go through and have a little bit of a quiz and see if you can guess what the age restrictions of the products are. Uh, road traffic, this is where we're responsible, similar to metrology, we're responsible for checking that vehicles on the roads are not uh, A, unroadworthy. So somebody is selling you a vehicle which is dangerous because it's... Um, on road where they are if it's overloaded. So on some of the motorways you may see um, large 
sort of um, strips of land behind um, fencing. These are actually what's called dynamic axle weighers, um, and it's a form of weigh bridge. And we use these to uh, weigh wagons and to weigh large vehicles. Um, illegal money lending, again, another one that's causing a real, real uh, problem in the current economic climate, and also that has an absolutely evil effect on our most vulnerable residents. Um, this is where basically people who uh, are struggling to find or struggling to get traditional credit often go to um, the person that is perceived or has groomed them and is their friend and all the rest of it, and it turns out to not be, and there's some really unpleasant consequences to illegal money lending. Um, and then finally one, animal health and welfare. So trading standards have animal health officers who are responsible for ensuring for the um, welfare of animals, um, medicines of animals, uh, animal feed. Basically just ensuring when you put all those boxes together, it's a farm to fork uh, holistic approach. So that's the main functions, but that's that's not what we're here to talk about this afternoon. I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a flavour. So safeguarding. The main area for trading standards contribution to this is the area of scams and fraud. Now, scams and fraud are financial abuse, full stop. They are financial abuse. Now, no matter the delivery system of a scam, so be it postal, telephone, email, in person, um, they are all frauds that trading standards and the police and other agencies are looking to combat and to stop vulnerable and disadvantaged people being targeted by them because scams are very much targeted. Um, the, the types of scams that you guys are getting, and I guarantee you're getting them, you'll have all have had texts, you'll all have had emails, they will not necessarily be the same ones that I receive. Scams are very much um, based on what's unfortunately called um, suckers lists. So this may be where you've made a subscription to a particular website or you've searched online for a particular product. All that data is sort of all jumbled up and it identifies basically the scam for you. Now, worryingly, um, the UK economy is losing between five and 10 billion a year to fraud. And that figure is increasing, um, which is incredibly worrying in itself. But from a safeguarding point of view, our main thrust is the huge detrimental effect that scams and fraud have on individuals. Um, like I've said there, they have a devastating impact on victims and will increase the disadvantage and the vulnerability and the vulnerability and inequality that they suffer. Just to give you a little bit of context, um, I worked with um, a lady who was bedridden, seriously vulnerable individual. She'd been convinced that she'd won the um, Australian lottery, which is a very common scam, a very common scam. And it's amazing how many people fall for it or are taken in by it, but they are very convincing. And she was so convinced that she'd won the Australian lottery and she was such a good person that she'd started spending her winnings on her friends and family. So she, as well as losing money to the scammers, she was now getting deeper and deeper into debt because she was spending the money that she thought was coming. So it's it's a it's a horrible, horrible thing to for a person to fall victim to a scam or a fraud. Um, it's incredibly traumatic. Um, even if it's somebody that say feels that um, you know, or oh, I I would never fall victim to a scam. Yeah. We all do. We all do. That's fact. And like I say, everybody in this meeting now will have had 
a scam and will have come close if not actually responded to one. I know I have. Um, and just think how how you feel when you do that. So how many times is that replicated or made even worse when you're already in a vulnerable position? Um, the most sinister, and this is one that we're most proactive about, are those that have an element of grooming. OK, so if the criminal has developed a meaningful relationship with that victim. So we're talking um, a romance scam. We're talking a psychic scam. We're talking um, to a certain extent a, a religious scam. So to, to put that in context, that that's where somebody um, of a sh particularly strong religious belief has been contacted out the blue by somebody who's been contacted by an angel who said they have to buy this special lucky charm and if they don't buy this lucky charm then their deceased relatives will never rest and it's it's a horrible horrible scam and they're the ones that really really upset me when i see the effect it has on people because these people are really taken in by this and they hand over vast amounts of money and it's not just it's not just that there was again another case where a lady was told that there was an evil spirit in her bedroom this lady who was in her 80s was sleeping on the couch in the living room because she believed um the psychic that there was a um a malevolent spirit upstairs in her house so it's it's very very um serious effects it can have on certain people and then that the last line which is a very depressing line that uh, an older victim of doorstep crimes that's a, uh, a scam in person face to face is 2.4 times more likely to go into residential care or die within two years of the incident i mean that is that is shocking um and in relation to doorstep crime um the victim profile you're looking at a 81 year old female um so it's that's a little bit the background of what the issue is that trading standards are trying to deal with now trading standards has always um dealt with fraud we've always dealt with scams but recognizing the increase um here in surrey we uh, created a dedicated prevention team of which I manage. So in 2020, we set up a specific prevention team um, where a specialist unit of trading standards officers, so they're all officers, they, they can all do everything, but they come together to support vulnerable residents who have been or are susceptible to falling victim to a scam. Um, since it started in 2020, um, our officers have made in over 1,700 interventions. So that's 1,700 people that have received a scam or have been a victim to a scam that we've been able to step in and help them. Um, that generated around £37 million of savings um, and prevented approximately 140,000 scams so that's since the team started but just looking at the stats from last year so they made uh, about 642 interventions with individuals that's individuals with vulnerable characteristics um in addition to that are all the scams that are targeting businesses and are targeting people that don't necessarily have traditional vulnerable characteristics. But as everybody on this call knows, vulnerability is a sliding scale. Um, somebody could be not vulnerable today and vulnerable tomorrow. It all depends on circumstances. It all depends on what happens to that individual. So we have to be mindful of um, an individual's circumstances. Um, so the total amount of money saved last year was 1.1 million. So that's actual money that we got back for people. Um, we responded to 19 doorstep crime incidences, which again 
prevented losses of around £184,000. That's money where our intervention, we've stopped that money being handed over. Um, we've installed 110 call blocker devices. Now, a call blocker device is uh, a device that connects to a landline. And basically, it stops those scammers and fraudsters invading that resident's safe space, i.e. their home. Because if somebody calls up and they're answering the phone and they're sat in their favourite armchair, they're going to be relaxed. They're going to be more susceptible. So what we try and do is stop that to start off with. So we, we installed 100 tel call block devices. We have about four, 547 in total in the fleet. Um, we also installed 31 door cameras. So the door cameras we use for people who are potentially vulnerable or have been a victim of face-to-face -face fraud or crime of the doorstep. So um, we fit 31 door cameras. Um, the call blockers have blocked about 48,000 scam and nuisance calls and prevented about £1.8 million. Pounds. Now, when you take all of that into uh, consideration and then you also add the additional prevention work that the team does, so that's things like compensation orders, so where we've successfully prosecuted a fraudster or a scammer and we've got people their money back, we've got people compensation, we've undertook various initiatives and things like that. When you add all that together, that comes to about 11.1 .1 million. So that is a huge amount of money that not only is we're stopping it fueling criminality, but it's also coming back into the legitimate economy. So we're ta even here in Surrey, we're talking huge amounts of money. So safeguarding so trading standards together with partner agencies we investigate scams we identify and we support people who have been victim and who potentially could be victim we're very much prevention focused um so our aims are to identify the most at-risk residents and provide holistic support so that's where we work with Everybody sat around this table, adult social care, housing. We we can't do it on our own. We need to be able to backfill, and to backfill, it takes all of us all together to do that. Um, to intervene and protect victims from further victimisation, the resident may not even be aware that they have fallen victim to a scam. They may think it's genuine. They may be too afraid to admit that it's a scam. So that's where our officers and partners, you know, we have to be um, gentle in trying to persuade them that um, this is a criminal act. We investigate criminal activity. So just very quickly, we did, um, we broke up a big international scam that was operating out of Kansas in America. And um, following the investigation and working with our colleagues at the Federal Trade Commission in the US, um, a federal judge over in America, um, he authorised the seizure of this um, scam company, um, all of their assets. And from that, we were able to return just to people in Surrey. So just for our own residents, we returned about, I think, six and a half thousand pounds um, that those people had handed over. So that's another good news example that we do investigate, we do take action where we can. Um, one of our main thrusts is to reduce the opportunities for fraud just by making people more aware and more confident, you know, and to get across that message that it's fine to say no, it's fine to put the, the phone down. You know, so many people are really polite and really pleasant and criminals and fraudsters will take advantage of that. Um, rogue builders who have the, you know, a silver tongue and the, the gift of the uh, the gab and things like that. That is what they're relying on, people's good manners and people's goodwill. We want to increase engagement with, with everybody, basically, but we have uh, a particular thrust of trying to reach those marginalised groups who not only are targeted, but they may not be aware of 
the systems in place, the support systems that are out there, what the law is. Um, so we're really, really trying to reach out and, and get to those people that A, may not be aware of the law and B, may be reluctant to report it. And just to say they're as much entitled to our protection as anybody else. Um, and then finally, the, the ultimate one is just to influence people to be confident and to take a stand against scams and fraud. That's that's the, the mantra that we are trying to um, take. Now, as part of that, we have various resources that we distribute and we can share with agencies such as you. So these are just examples of some of our leaflets. So the first one is about how to get a free true call unit. Uh, the second one is free shopping advice, both online and in person, and that is translated into easy read so that you know before you go into the shop or before you click purchase, you know what your rights are. Next one is a no call calling pack. So that way it gives advice. It also has a sticker telling unwanted callers don't don't knock on my door. If they do knock on the door, then we're looking at potential criminal offences that we can take action on. And then the last one is one on scams. We've got additional ones about romance fraud. We've got additional ones um, about a whole range of different things. But that's just an example of the materials that we distribute that we can share with you guys if you need it. Now coming on to the technology. So first off, the big yellow sticker in the middle, that's what the no call calling sticker looks like so we issue them they're free somebody puts it into their front window or the the door and it tells people you know they're not welcome um and like it says on there failure to comply is a criminal offense um, and that's something that ourselves or the police would be able to take action again. So it gives a little bit of reassurance. It gives the resident that confidence to be able to say no and to be able to shut the door. Um, the top left hand picture, that is the door camera that we install for free for those people that um, would benefit from it. Um, if any of you guys or any of your agencies come across anybody that is susceptible to crime on the uh, doorstep you know by all means contact trading standards like i said the those uh, door cameras are free we do give them out um gratis um what we do the only thing that we do ask is that we we ask for feedback so we have to measure the we have to evaluate the effectiveness of them. So it's just a, a case of every six months, we will contact that person and just say, how are you feeling in your home? Do you feel safer um, and similar things? Bottom left hand corner, that is what a true call call blocker looks like. Little small box, connects to your landline. Um, very discreet, but very, very effective. And then in the right hand corner, we're not giving out mobile phones. We're not that generous, but um, the technology hasn't quite caught up to block scam text messages and scam calls to mobiles. So we could do it on landlines, but we're not quite there with mobiles. So what we've done here in Surrey, we've developed um, a ringtone, which if the number called is not recognized, then it will ring this special message, which we'll hear at the end of this talk. Um, and it just acts as a prompt for the resident to be cautious and just to be careful. And similarly, when such a call comes through, it also brings up uh, an image just, just warning people. So if if there's a, a hearing difficulty, it will bring up a visual um, warning just to make people aware that, you know, just be a bit cautious. You don't know who this is. This isn't, you know, on your um, on your friends list. So just just be cautious. So this I just wanted to show you. So the, with the true call units that are installed, we do as well as protecting the resident. It also provides us with really invaluable intelligence and information about what type of scams are targeting our residents. Now, this is um, 
a summary of what targeted our residents last year. Now, as you can see, the the main ones are all sort of cost of living. So you've got loft insulation, you've got solar panels, domestic appliance warranties, boilers. Um, these are all scams that people are folding up and they're trying to, you know, make you hand over money. Medical devices. That's a little bit of a worrying one, that one. So medical devices is coming in at nine percent of all calls. And that's that's companies trying to get people to sign up to um, you know, the medical alert um the buttons that people press if they fall over, they press this button, I'll sign up to a thing. So they're scams in relation to that. Um going down that less debt collection, telecoms um amazon sky a lot of it similar worryingly the psychic and the religious i i don't like that being that high up so we we really need to bring that down but that's just give you an example of how it's this it's a double-sided benefit it benefits the resident but similarly it enables us to focus and also all those scam numbers that try to get through what we do is those are sent to the information commissioner and the information commissioner shuts down those numbers. So we're actually preventing other people falling for those particular numbers. Now, admittedly, they just go and open another number or, or whatever, but it just it just shows how we are proactively trying our best to protect people in their own home. That's just an example of some of the feedback that we've got in relation to um, the work that we do. So as you would expect, it's really positive. It's a lot of really good feedback from carers, from concerned family members that, um, you know, if, if they can't be there with them, we're actually putting in place systems that will safeguard and protect them without changing their um, sort of daily routine. So it is very much about um, just being as supportive as we can for the individual and also for the resident. Now, what I wanted to come on to is to mention the Serious and Organised Crime Partnership Board. So Trading Standards, just like many, many other agencies, are a, men uh, are a member of the Serious and Organised Crime Partnership Board. So I chair it. And the deputy chair is a uh, DCS Boshia of Surrey Police. Now, this is uh, a multi agency group that covers the whole of Surrey. Um, and yes, it's tackling serious organised crime. And many of you wonder well, what, what's that got to do with safeguarding? What's that got to do with us here in Surrey? But these scams, these frauds are cross border. It doesn't originate in Surrey and it doesn't finish in Surrey. We're talking people from across the world that are trying to uh, target our most vulnerable residents. So that's where the SOC board comes in. And like in the second paragraph, the SOC board identifies the significant financial and psychological effect it has on our residents. Um, and also that it is a true multi-agency issue. This is not something that adult social care can do in isolation. This is not something the police can do in isolation. It's very much a holistic individual approach to supporting um, vulnerable people. So one of the main thrusts of the Serious and Organised Crime Board is to not only um, sort of ensure that we're all singing from the same song sheet, that we're not duplicating efforts, that our valuable resources are focused where it needs to be focused. It also ensures greater consistency for the individual and ultimately better outcomes, not only for enforcement, like I mentioned earlier, providing it's been intelligence and information that we can go on and extract those criminals but also from a prevention point of view and a safeguarding point of view that is really a strong thrust for this board and 
just to reiterate that nationally, so the National Crime Agency, who are the national coordinators for serious and organised crime, um, they've recognised the importance of safeguarding as well. So their four national priorities that we feed into, you know, number one, criminals exploit vulnerabilities. That is a national priority that is feeding down through us, through individual agencies and down through the individual people. So it's it's like a big triangle. But I just wanted to highlight that this this is something that there are so many agencies that you may not think of immediately that are all trying their best to sort of prevent um, the need for safeguarding in the first place. So they recognise that criminals are exploit exploiting the cost of living. That's where I was mentioning earlier about some people that may not see themselves as vulnerable, suddenly are vulnerable, um, especially from a, a financial point of view or a social point of view. Um, uh, the advances in technology, that is something that that's difficult to get a hold of with the increases in artificial intelligence that is going to prove very very challenging we're already exploring um how we can start to address that but ai does that is going to be the next big stumbling block for us um and that criminals are resilient um and they've adopted to the challenging environment um, I mean, just to give you a, a, a bit of a silly example, so those with the cost of living, those people that might be socially using um, harder drugs are not doing so anymore because they can't afford it. So those same drug gangs are now moving to illicit tobacco. So now we're focusing on illicit tobacco, so it's it's it doesn't go away, it just changes what what's happening to it. Those are the objectives of our board. And as you can see, the first one is to maintain and develop a multi-agency integrated framework, okay, that shares intelligence, preventative and protective activity, expertise and investigative resource. Now, one of my um, reasons for doing this today is to not only highlight this work that's going on, but also to encourage that if your agency thinks that they could, um, well, you could all contribute to it, but if you would like to proactively contribute to the board, and if you would like to join us, then please um, contact us because we need a wide and we need a diverse range of partners just to ensure that we are giving a fully cohesive needs-based service. So that that invitation is, is open to you guys. Um, then we've got the strategic uh, and operational decision making, um, reducing duplication of protect and prevent measuring. Um, and then number four, improve the quality of victim care available to victims. So this is really, really important. So the police, you know, they're really good, but they're not specialists in um, adult social care or they're not specialists in um, scams or fraud or anything like that. So it takes us as various agencies to come together and just decide who's the most appropriate, who can make the biggest positive benefit to that individual. Um, and then the last one is just that our members um, undergo training and have appropriate tools. This is just a quick summary uh, again of the board. These are the four key areas of focus that we look at. So all of these ha have an element of safeguarding linked to them, but the main areas of focus have vulnerabilities, so modern slavery, immigration crime, youth violence, uh, exploitation, prosperity, fraud, the money laundering, the cyber crime that, that I've been touching upon today. Uh, commodities, so uh, drugs, county lines, um, firearms, that type of thing. And then we've got the cross cutting themes, which is the anti-corruption, prisoner offender management, 
uh, and SOC enablers. Again, when you put all them together, it's all about prevention. It's all about um, dealing with an issue and then backfilling with something so that criminality doesn't come back in there. Again, the strategic priorities. I just wanted to highlight again how that fits with the National Crime Agency. So ours are drug related harm and county lines, economic crime, uh, serious and organised acquisitive crime. So that's um, like theft and um, things like that. Modern slavery and human trafficking, which is um, a big problem. That's our Surrey priority strategically, and they align with the national which is um, to deal with those that dominate communities. So we're talking gangs, we're talking loan sharks, we're talking um, particular scammers, exploiting the vulnerable. That's safeguarding right there, national priority. We need to ensure that vulnerable people, you know, if we can't stop them being targeted, that we safeguard them to try and prevent it. Um, and undermining the UK economy. That 11 million that I mentioned right at the beginning, that that potentially was going to come out of the Surrey economy, that 11 million. Now, because of the intervention, that 11 million hopefully will come back in and we can use that for legitimate local concerns. Now, very quickly, I've been talking about partnerships all the way through this. Partnership has been, that really is the theme of what I've been trying to talk about. And we all know what the challenges are. Um, Two million residents. This is, I've included Buckinghamshire in that. So Trading Standards covers about two million residents. About a fifth of the population over 65. We have uh, high numbers of uh, dementia. The reluctance to report it, like I said, either through fear so fear of what are the consequences of me not sending money? What are the consequences of me telling somebody that I have sent money? What will that affect happen to me? Will they think I can't look after myself? Intimidation. You know, if the going back to that lady, if you don't buy this lucky charm, then the evil spirit will come and haunt you for the rest of your life. Embarrassment. You know, oh, you know, I should. I know I shouldn't have done that, but but I have, so I'm not going to tell anyone. If you don't tell anyone, we can't prevent other people falling for it. Uh, ignorance, like I said, they don't know it's a scam. They think it's genuine, and then confusion. Who who do they report it to? What is is this a scam? Is this not a scam? Who do I ask? Um, answer is come to trading standards, even just contact us, even if you've got any doubt, you can contact us. But what we always say is, before you respond, just talk to somebody, talk to family, talk to friends, talk to um, somebody in the street. I mean, that gets very challenging if you are a socially isolated individual and you're in that environment and that's why we are trying to reach out to give them a way of for them to just say do you think this is a scam because as soon as you say out loud your common sense will sort of kick in and you will think that it's too good to be true i shouldn't i shouldn't be doing that really um other challenge is language so we have uh, a number of people where English is not their first language. So how do we overcome those barriers? We've then got the cultural sensitivities and the uh, and barriers to to overcome or to reflect. And that's where we need. That's why we work so closely with various communities and groups um, just to make it relevant and to make it uh, useful to them. We've got the isolated and the marginalised, touched upon them a little bit earlier. Um, we've also got issues where there may be a particular group who are reluctant to report things to an authority figure. Um, you know, they may not trust councils or police or, or whatever. So that that's another challenge for us to overcome and to address those low levels of reporting. But working together as a partner, my word, the opportunities are just 
you know, fantastic. We've got an access to a, a diverse range of knowledge, skills and experience. So if you come across something out in the field, you know, you may not know, but I mean, you can just send an email, you can send a text message, you can phone, for example, trading standards. You know, this person needs help with a bank, a bank are refusing to give them their money back. You know, just let us know and we can help them. It widens our reach and it also diversifies our reach. So our clients that we're dealing with are going to be different to the clients that Summary Fire and Rescue are dealing with that are going to be different to, but they're all vulnerable and they're all, we can help uh, together. Share expertise and investigative resources. Um, avoid duplication. Now, how many people you know, I've spent an awful lot of time doing a fantastic leaflet only to discover that there's already 10 exact same leaflets out there. You know, let's let's share what resources we've got. Um, coordinate our activity. That's that's really important. We've been doing a lot of work with the Armed Forces Covenant um, and that's working, you know, really well and a lot of work with the fire service and it just gives it improves the outcomes for those individuals because it gives them, like I say, a cohesive um, safeguarding experience. Not only is it dealing with, you know, the the, the, the real, um, say, medical issues, but if we can improve their environment as well, surely that has to be a good thing. It has to be. Um, I wanted to finish with a good news story because I know that's not all everything I've said has been that positive, but this is a real case from earlier this year. OK, this is a case in Surrey. So this is not some case plucked out of the air that happened miles away. This happened in our county. Now, these two, father and son, um, doorstep crime rogue traders, for want of a better word. So they were targeting vulnerable older residents. They were offering £5,500 to paint or render their home. OK, so in £5,500, it's still way, way expensive for what they did. The work we actually valued at 850 But that was nothing. Another victim was quoted 2100 but ended up paying two hundred thousand pounds and that happened again again and again and that was across surrey sussex kent brighton um so this is serious organized crime on the surface of it oh it's just road builders there's no such thing as just road builders these are organized criminals that are operating across uh, county lines across borders and are extorting huge amounts of money and causing real, real upset to very vulnerable residents. Um, like it says there, they were targeting and grooming, going back to the charming um, persona that they put on. They intimidated elderly and vulnerable residents. So when they said, oh, I haven't got any money, they would bundle them into the back of the van and take them down and get the money out of the bank. They were aggressive if they weren't, you know, if they weren't handed over the money. Um, and then the last two were just some quotes, you know, this used up our pension fund. We were trying to get the house in order because the husband was terminally ill um before he passed away so they were trying to get their affairs in order they were so intimidated that they you know handed their money over to these two um and then unfortunately the the gentleman did die um and so they had all this going on while they were also grieving absolutely horrific but they were caught they were prosecuted and hugh smith on the left received eight years custodial. Um, John Smith on the right received a 14 month custodial and Michael Smith, who was another relative, he received, received 14 months suspended. Um, and again, assets were seized, that money is being used to compensate those victims. So 
I just wanted to use that as an example of um, the flip side of safeguarding, the, the prevention, the enforcement and the work that um, perhaps non-traditional safeguarding agencies are, are actually doing. So those are our social media contacts. Um, what we do is we regularly update all our social media with the latest alerts, the latest scans, the latest frauds, what's happening in the um, criminal feed. So either yourself or you could encourage your clients to um, follow them if they want to see what was happening. Um, the contacts for trading standards, um, that's our top one trading.standards. That is our public email address so anybody can use that to contact trading standards if you've got specific intelligence that you want to share with us agency to agency then that's ts intelligence at surrey cc and then on there i've put the crime stoppers number for those for anybody that wishes to report anything and remain anonymous and then consumer advice that is our sort of uh call centre. So the Citizens Advice Consumer Service, which that number is, they give first tier consumer advice and then it's referred to the local trading standards officer to deal with. So that brings me to the end. And now, you guys, I, I mentioned, didn't I, the ringtone that um, we're encouraging people to install on their phones. I'm now going to play it for you. I warn you this will stick in your head but let me see if i can get this to Don't play to anyone on the phone, to anyone on the phone, oh no no, don't give out your bank details, to anyone on the phone, when your phone rings at home. So there you go, and that's the end of my presentation, so thank you for your time. I don't know if there's any uh, questions that anybody has about that. Let me just find my screen again. Stop sharing. So hopefully that was informative. Um, and hopefully that ringtone won't. You'll have that for the rest of the day now. You'll be thinking, you know, which is the point, which is the point of it, isn't it? We want people to think about that. Um, so do we have any questions in the time remaining? We haven't got anything in the chat bar at the moment, Lee, but what I'll nope. do is I will open uh, microphones and cameras for people just in case they do have any questions. So I'll just turn that on now for you. Yeah. All. I mean, if, if anybody wants to, I mean, this is a safe space. Does anybody want to share any sort of scams or any dodgy texts that they've had recently? Because it's what we need to do is we just need to to talk about it and say, well, I, I had this. And as soon as you say that, somebody else will say, oh, I saw that, or my sister saw that, or it's just getting people to talk about it. That's that's the first step. Um, and then from there, recognising it, and then we can come in and, and help. But we've got lots and lots of resources that you guys are more than welcome to, to have and that we will share. Yep, Janet. Oh, good afternoon. I just wanted to say thank you. That was so um, helpful and interesting. Um, and I won't give any um, specific details, but just to say I do refer into trading standards and I've referred to safeguarding cases this week. Um, so hopefully they'll be able to help. One was a doorstop caller and the ladies lost allegedly over a hundred thousand pounds. Yes. And the other yes. one is um like a cryptocurrency sort of fraud. Um, yeah. But I, I'm hoping that you might be able to help with that one. The police have said that they have got no positive lines of inquiries and they've closed. And um, yeah, so I don't yeah. really know what to do to help this lady, but I have referred, emailed over yesterday, I think. I know, so. I've seen it. I've read those two referrals oh. and I've allocated up to 
the local office to action. The, the cryptocurrency one, that's a really good point actually to share, that cryptocurrency, because of the nature of Surrey, um, it's a big problem at the moment. There is a lot of cryptocurrency scams targeting our residents and does anybody really know what cryptocurrency is so they're being baffled and bamboozled by all this wonderful stuff and the returns and, and all the rest of it and we have people or oh, i've had another case where you know in a before they retired they were you know top bankers and things like that so they, they feel that they understand it but they don't because it's it's a new thing I'll hold my hands up. I don't fully understand crypto currency. Do your team actually you. go out and visit, do home visits? Yes. You do. Okay. Yeah. So what Thank they'll do you. is they will do um, an intervention with with you as the person, you know, to sort of, they'll be doing joint visits and they'll go out and they'll do an assessment. Um, our main priority is to um, deal with that person and their vulnerabilities first before we take any sort of investigative action. We need to make sure that they're protected and they're not going to fall further victim. But no, somebody will be in yeah. contact, I guarantee Thank you. Thank you so much. Anybody else? I think we've got uh, Gurpreet with her hand up, Lee. Yep. Hello. Hi, um, Lee, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I found that really valuable. Um, and I like the fact that you've obviously um, looked at the preventative side of it um, because it's easy to just focus on when the actual um, abuse has actually taken place. And then yeah. we are then um, focus on the safeguarding and, and, you know, and raising those referrals. Um, yeah. And um, I think it obviously is quite helpful um, just to, to hear one of the um, individuals on the call talking about the doorstop caller and the cryptocurrency, because I didn't even think about that. So it's something mm. I will away. Um, I've moved from acute um, now to community setting. Um, so we are yeah. doing a lot of um, home visits and obviously it will be um, those kind of risk assessments that we look um, look to when we actually visit our patients um, in the home environment. So I was just wondering, because um, I'm reviewing the training at the moment, if we, uh, if there was anything you could potentially share, um, yeah, take forward to raise that awareness um, within our organisation um, around the preventative measures and yeah. your contact really. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I've, I've got to mention that. So trading standards, we do. Um, well, every month we do a webinar for everybody to attend that's about scams and frauds and, and things like that. And that's usually done in partnership with another agency. So for um, during Adult Safeguarding Week on the Tuesday, we're doing a trading standards are doing the scams and fraud and then Age Concern are going to do powers of attorney. But in relation to training, yes, we can do we can train frontline officers. Um, and we can also train communities. We've got that set up now and we can do that remotely. So if you have a team meeting, yeah. we could actually come in and deliver that training for your officers. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be really helpful. Um, and we do do levels, um, our level three training. So even if you did a segment on that, um, that would be amazing because then it would just raise that awareness to those who are. Who Definitely. Are yeah, right. definitely. We we train many agencies, including the police and um, various people. So, yeah, if, um, like I said, Karen's got my contact details. They're on this presentation anyway, which I don't know if that's been shared. Hopefully it will be. Um, so you'll be able to contact me from that. And that applies to anyone else. If any agencies would like training, contact me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Uh, we just got another question, Lee. Uh, so yep. it's from Amy. Do we refer via the email address or is there a form? Nope, just via the uh, email address. Um, or the MASH, you can refer to us through the MASH, obviously. Um, but if it's not if it's not a, a, a MASH issue, yeah, you can contact us through, through that email and it'll come through and one of our local officers will, um, will deal with it. And like I say, it, it may not be a prevention matter. It might be something 
from one of the other areas of training standards. Um, but we'll, we'll be able to look at it and, and give you the best response we can. Okay, is that? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lee. Um, as we said, uh, everybody, thank you all for attending today and thank you, Lee, for your time. Um, really insightful and really informative. So I think uh, we've we've had a really great uh, information awareness for around safeguarding and trading standards and how they really kind of align together. Um, the slides will be available on our website shortly um, and the full recording will also be available for you um, if you did miss the beginning bit or if you joined halfway. Um, so we will get that on our website. Um, there is a feedback link uh, which will it's in the web ch uh, the chat bar so you should see it right at the top um, if you could just provide some feedback for us just on this webinar and any other webinar topics that you'd like us to cover uh, in the near future it would be really helpful um, so again thank you all for your time um, that's our last webinar for this year. We do have our conference next month, uh, which is uh, during Safeguarding Adults Week. Uh, so it's the 22nd of November. Um, you can find out more information uh, on our website. Um, but if you do want to register, then just uh, email the board or, or get in touch with us and we can help you get the registration link. Um, and then again, we'll, we'll be setting up our webinars series from January. So I think the next topic, we've got the Solace Centre of Surrey. So they'll be coming in to talk about uh, sexual assault and referrals for the Solace Centre. Um, again, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, during, during Safeguarding Adults Week on the Friday, we're, we're going to have information stands at all the Squire Garden Centres. So, so come along and... and Say hello. Come, come get a true call unit. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Lee. Thank you, gents. Thank you very much.